The old adage is true that as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. Working America has given us a lot to think about with their April 2017 report interviewing swing voters in that state. Matt Morrison, Deputy Director of Working America, will join me this week and we'll hear from Working America's field director, Soren Norris, stationed in Ohio. That's all ahead on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Welcome. Mainstream media keep telling us that Trump voters are sticking by their man, but are they really? And what do so-called swing voters actually want? Working America, the community organizing affiliate of the AFL-CIO, took to the streets and sidewalks of central Ohio earlier this year to find out. Matt Morrison, deputy director of Working America, is here with me to share the findings of the Front Porch Focus Group report and what lessons progressives can take from it into the 2018 election. Matt, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Laura, thank you so much for having us. So the Front Porch Focus Group, why, why the name? You know, when we came up with the methodology, we wanted to understand, is this a survey? Is it a poll? Is it a focus group? And we were just brainstorming and we realized what we're really doing is having uh, extensive conversations with a large enough number of voters that we can draw inferences about what the trends are among different segments. But it ultimately isn't intended to be representative, but it's certainly intended to be informative. Well, you talk to a lot of people. I mean, how many? Who? Why? Where? We talked to, what, 976 voters for this particular project. And this is one of a series of the front, front porch focus group series that we've done dating back to early 2016. Why we do this work? We know that by getting face to face with people, you can get not just the top lines of what support levels are, but you can understand why they're supporting the candidates, the positions, the issues that are animating so them. So that's why you didn't just call them up or send them an email survey? Absolutely. We know that if I go and knock on your door, one out of three people are going to open that door and have a conversation with you. You're going to really get a chance to listen to them, and you don't have to work from a script. You have to work from what the human being is telling you. Are they busy? Do they have dinner on the, t on the stove? Uh, do they really want you to come and sit down and have a smoke with them on the front porch? I've raised money in my college years for the 9 to 5 organization of working women and found just what you said. People will talk to you if you're standing on their doorstep. They'll even give you money. Um, what did you find? What insights came out of doing all this kind of very labor-intensive work? Well, you know, for us, the lesson really learned from this is always listen more than you talk. Mm -hmm. And from that, we were able to hear a few clear insights. Number one, while Trump voters are by and large continuing to stick by him, they're very movable. What, some 80 percent of the swing voters we spoke to, uh, uh, who were Trump voters to begin with, said, yes, they still approve of the job he's doing. But if you introduce real information that connects with their lives, like his tax policies, his workplace safety plans, more than half of them start to express doubts. So give us a little bit more depth on that. Explain. Sure. One of the examples comes from Delaware Township. This is about 50 miles north of Columbus. Uh, a fellow by the name of Jim was coming home. He's a construction worker. When our canvasser Soren approached him to talk about uh, the Front Porch Focus Group project. And we asked Jim a whole series of questions, one of which was, had you heard about Trump's proposal to roll back workplace safety regulations? That got Jim thinking, hey, I got hurt on the job about 20 years ago. That's not what he promised. And ultimately, the more we can introduce information that isn't so worked over, that is, tell people something they don't know, mm -hmm. as opposed to telling them what they know is wrong, uh, the more we can introduce a different way of thinking. We had a chance to talk with Soren, actually. He's one of your field organizers in Ohio. Here, here's some of what he had to say. This spring, in, uh, we, we talked to almost 1,000 swing-type voters. Uh, you know, um, many who voted for Trump, some who voted for Clinton, but people that we identified as uh, softer voters, not ideological, um, throughout uh, middle Ohio, um, within Columbus and in some of the rural areas around Columbus um, and also the suburbs. And what we were doing was, uh, you know, engaging them on a lot of questions, really digging deep story sharing and connecting that to the candidates and why they voted for uh, who they voted for, and then also seeing how we could pivot them away from Donald Trump. 
There were five of us as a steady team working on this uh, five days a week. We go out in the afternoons when people tend to be home, so we canvass between four and nine o'clock. And we did have a targeted list. We were looking at people that had income between 25 and 75,000, so solid middle class, working class people. And then also people that were very likely voters. So not only did they vote in a presidential election, but they had voted in one of the recent midterm elections. So high propensity voters, working class voters, people that maybe hadn't like voted only one party for the past 40 years. I was attracted to this type of work because it's very real. There's not really much more real than engaging someone where they live, on their porch or in their living room, a couple feet from them, the eye-to-eye -eye contact, the story sharing. One thing that we do that's very powerful is we kind of talk about our stories, our personal struggles with these issues to kind of get the voter to open up. So you can't, uh, you know, a commercial or um, a poll on the phone could never be as powerful as a real human connection the ability to like introduce new information can really open them up and you can shed light and you're actually able to move voters in the moment within that conversation a lot stronger than you know other means and i think that's one of the reasons why you know i'm attracted to this work i've really seen it work well we had a huge victory in 2011 on senate bill 5 here uh, john Kasich had attacked collective bargaining for the public sector unions we were able to get out ahead create the correct narrative for what was actually going on. And by having these face-to-face -face conversations really like overwhelmingly defeat this at the ballot box, um, it really does work. I think the only limitation is we're not big enough. We don't have enough of these conversations. We don't cover all of the rural areas or all the inner city areas that need to be uh, having these conversations, you know? And that the only reason that like kind of the TV the news media and the commercial drowns out our message is just because it's so much more widespread. We're limited by the numbers. So, but within one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction, it's extremely powerful. People will really open up about what's going on in their lives. You could never have that kind of connection over the phone or even over Skype. You need to be literally face-to-face -face and where you can see how they're living, how their kids are living, what's actually going on in their life. The mistake a lot of campaigns make is that Campaigns really get organized kind of last minute just after Labor Day is when they start hitting the doors. It's a little too late because what we saw with this Trump project is if you really want to flip someone from one side to the other, it takes more than one conversation. So we could, we could get them to our side if they're already halfway there organically when we hit the door. Um, it's going to take multiple conversations and some time in between those conversations. So it needs to be started really early. Um, the, the, the example I used in the Senate Bill uh, 5, issue 2 here in um, 2011 that I worked on, we, we had worked on it for about eight or nine months. So we had talked to voters about it. We were doing some petitioning. We went back and talked to them again. If we had just started in the fall, um, it may not have been as effective. So it really needs to be like a whole year-long cycle which is kind of what's unique about our group. We, we keep paid, paid professional, full-time you know, organizers going year round. There's countless memorable stories. Uh, you're having these very deep and personal conversations, not every door, not every person's gonna wanna let you into their lives like that. But when you get the opening and you have the skilled canvasser, um, you really can get people to open up um, and then connect the dots between their personal struggles for them and their family and the issues that the candidates are actually fighting for. One, one example is Gertrude. I knocked on her door a couple months ago. I think she's 84. It was a Trump household. It was her and her daughter. They invited me in. I came into the living room. Uh, Gertrude was kind of curled up in the corner reading a book, um, very defensive. Her rationale, anyone was better than Obama, kind of closed minded but her daughter was more engaging. And you know, I talked to them and they gave their reasons for voting for Trump, which was similar to a lot of folks. They just, um, they're kind of sick of the direction things have gone. Um, a lot of people have been left out of this economy. Um, they have legitimate concerns that, uh, that the economy is not working for them um, and that things aren't as good as they were 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and so a lot of them voted for Trump in hope that some outsider could somehow bring back um, 
the strong economy that they remember from decades past, um, especially in the Midwest with the manufacturing and everything. You know, most of us know that's probably not going to happen. It'd be nice if we could move in that direction. So they, they were a little bit defensive, but hopeful for Trump. And I remember sharing one piece of new information about HEAP, the heating assistant program, federal heating assistant program that a lot, a lot of the income families in Ohio depend on. I think two out of five, actually, in, Ohio, in central Ohio are on this program. Um, and I talked about Trump's plan to um, cut drastically this program, maybe even eliminate funding for the program. And her Gertrude's daughter uh, literally sunk into her couch. I mean, when I said that, and then she just whispered up to me, "We're on heat, you know." And this is a, ran a little ranch house, a lower income neighborhood. Um, and when you introduce these types of new information, um, the voters respond um, appropriately. They understand that if this is true, and a lot of times they'll say, "Well, if this tax plan is true, I'm going to lose my support for them." And that so that really illustrates. They were a strong Trump after that conversation. Now they're questioning their support. They would need another follow up visit to push them all the way. Um, and they would have to see some of these things materializing that we're talking about. Um, but it really illustrates um, that people are more movable than like CNN and the national media is making people think they are. That, that's an example of someone you know moving halfway. Another door, um, when Trump's health care plan came up, um, for, I forget his name, but let's say Donald. Um, and, you know, he was like in his 70s and his wife was in a wheelchair. He was concerned about health care costs. Um, and he had just heard, uh, you know, when the review of the two health care plans ago had come out, um, how this was going to impact uh, raise premiums potentially, especially on older folks. He said, if this is true, um, he his support's gone for Donald Trump. And we kind of heard the same thing over and over again when we talked about the tax plan. People said, well, if this tax plan actually goes forth with higher income people are disproportionately getting tax breaks, they're going to withdraw for Trump. So some people are organically moving throughout these past couple months, losing their support. And then when we get to talk to them, we push them further down the scale as they see kind of what's happening. Now, this isn't everybody. Obviously, some people are entrenched. Um, partisan, uh, will defend to the very end uh, any Republican or Trump because they see him as a hero, but people that are actually open to new information um, and have some critical thinking ability, which a lot of these folks do, no matter if they have a lower education level or um, a lower income level, um, they can connect the dots between policies that will hurt them or help them. Um, and they're totally movable. Uh, the national narrative is definitely off. I think that's the main takeaway from the, you know, the project is that people are moving on their own a little bit, and we can move them even further with these conversations. So, well, that sounds kind of encouraging to people who believe that Trump voters are kind of loosely attached to their candidate. But I'm still wondering about this definition of swing voter. Did you find that there really are such things? And what's the definition of a swing voter in an election period that's been so polarized? You know, first of all, I have to say, it's not inevitable that these softening supporters are actually going to defect from Trump and from Trumpism broadly. One of the things that we found is that these voters exist largely in an information bubble. Mm -hmm. They're not hearing about Russia the same way the rest of us are. You look at the Fox News webpage today, and the top story about Russia is buried so far down, and it's a criticism that there's no there there. In fact, when you look, though, at what's happening with these particular voters, we see clearly the, that information bubble is a problem consistently. And by bringing new information in to the people who are not hardened, uh, you can change the way they think yeah, about this. Yeah, but now you're stuff. in my home turf. I mean, how is that information bubble picture going to change? Well, knocking on someone's door is a pretty good way to break right through. I can get your attention for five minutes and add information to your perspective that you weren't otherwise hearing about. But we also should remember there's a really big difference between the folks who attend the Trump rallies, wear the red hats, that get into fights uh, with protesters, from people who are actually searching for some type of real economic solution. The, those populations are not one and the same. And in fact, in Ohio, some 400,000 more people voted for Barack Obama than Hillary Clinton. Now, some of those people stayed at home. 
Some of them switched to third party candidates, but a whole bunch of them pulled the lever for Barack Obama and for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That's our definition of a swing voter. So you raise the point that the loss to Trump of some of these voters who may drift away doesn't necessarily translate into a gain for the next Democratic candidate, whoever that might be. Um, where do you think those voters might go? And is it a challenge that you're, you're taking on to direct them towards the Democrat? We're certainly taking it on as a challenge. One of the problems that we consistently see is that the most salient issues that are associated with their concerns, the economic issues that Democrats communicate on, are important, but they speak to a different end of the economic spectrum. Some 17 percent of voters in the last election had incomes under $30,000. And so if your policy positions are raising the minimum wage to uh, $12, $15 an hour or offering paid sick leave, as important as those are, they're only reaching a very narrow band of the electorate in a personal way. The bigger concern is joblessness. If you look at the trend line on what's happening in a state like Ohio, you have massive displacement in good jobs and no real no, no prospects for improving those outcomes in the near term future. So speaking to a $21 an hour wage earner's interest is very different from speaking to the interest of a $10 an hour wage earner. And Democrats have to have a much broader message, policy framework. But they also have to make different choices. We're spending an inordinate amount of time on some of the traditional mechanisms for reaching voters that don't actually work. Uh, and spending too little time and too little resource, quite frankly, listening to these voters. Well, let's talk about those resources. I mean, Working America, it's affiliated with the AFL-CIO. How much support do you get? Do you get the support, the amount of support that you need? Well, we certainly get a fair amount of support from the AFL-CIO and the broader labor movement. But to be sure, the magnitude of the job that needs to be done here is so much larger than what we as an organization alone can do or what any uh, component of the progressive movement can do. This is an all-hands call. We need to put our individual differences aside as organizations and broaden the group of folks that we're reaching out to. I'll give you a figure. Barack Obama, in his successful 2012 campaign, uh, reached over 40 percent of voters in Ohio face to face. They recall the contact. Hillary Clinton's campaign reached around 28 percent. That type of dramatic drop in direct engagement isn't just a matter of effort. It's a matter of deciding who you will and won't talk to. Well, that speaks to a report that I saw recently coming out of the Center for Media Democracy and the PR Watch people into the funding strategies on the right, mm -hmm. what they called weaponized philanthropy, and in mm -hmm. particular the work of one foundation, the Bradley, um, Lyndon Harry Bradley Foundation based in Milwaukee, that has poured millions of dollars over the decades into shifting policy and practice across the states. Their number one funding target right now, it seems to me, is unions. Right. They are pushing anti-union legislation, lobbying, lawsuits. They're even funding people doing door-to-door -door canvassing, just as you were, saying that they want to find the union members who will break with their union bosses. Um, can you match that in terms of m money, resources, and kind of oomph? You know, the Koch brothers, a better known example of this, but really of the same ilk, have committed to spending nearly a billion dollars in the last cycle. They didn't get quite that far, mm -hmm. but that far outpaces anything that we have to bring to the table. That said, we don't need to match them dollar for dollar. We need to match them relationship to relationship, issue to issue. And on that playing field, I think we're more than equipped to do the work, more than resourced to undertake the mission. But again, we haven't always made the smartest decisions as a collective, not just Working America or the labor movement, about, but the progressive base about who we should talk to, when, how, and why it is we're talking to so them. So not just through TV ads, not just through phone service surveys. You need to be on the street, face to face, do this work. You also need to be smart about how you talk to people. I've, I've got that from your work. How does somebody get involved with Working America? Do you have to be a union member? Do you have to be affiliated with a union? Or can anyone sign up and get the training? Well, about a decade and a half ago, the labor movement saw that we needed a way to reach folks who weren't in a union anymore. And so they started Working America. 
Our model has been to go door to door using professional unionized canvassers who get a full training every day and get an opportunity to really practice their craft. We work all around the country and by signing people up to join, make a decision to be part of the labor movement even though they don't have a union on the job, we've broadened the base of the labor movement considerably. But we also see that given all of the energy pouring out into the streets right now, the resistance movement, we need to professionalize some of those skill sets. We can't just win in the coast or in the big cities. We have to take those skills and deploy people all around the country. One of our endeavors right now is to work in the Central Valley of California uh, where there are two targeted congressional races and really to start to change the composition of that electorate and the orientation of the existing voters through long-term organizing. And you address the economic issues you've talked about. What about issues of race and class and the fact that a lot of people have just grasped identity as their guiding star of political choice? Race and class are very real in our, our world. We see it all the time at the doors, but race and class clearly are not so much of an impediment that those 400,000 voters in Ohio that I mentioned wouldn't choose black, the black guy for president. Uh, you know, we have to understand that we're all complicated human beings, and while we may have a racial identity, a class identity, uh, uh, some type of cultural affinity uh, for our tribe, we also can be moved. We can. This is not inevitable, right? That is, the more information folks have, the more their worldview is shaped, and the more they see real solutions that hit home, the more likely they are to be responsive. All right, Matt Morrison, thank you so much for coming in. Great to hey, talk thank with you. you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Same to you. Much more ahead on the Laura Flanders Show. Thanks for watching. The twisted turns of the Trump Comey spectacle could keep us mesmerized for months, but they better not. And that's because while the drama playing out in D.C. is enough to turn one's stomach, what actually threatens the average American far more is happening as usual in the states. Drowned out by the Donald Din, old school conservatism is quietly going about its business as usual, building power, investing in infrastructure, and shifting policy and opinion to the right. Top-down media aren't just railed against by the rest of us for pledge drive reasons, and have you paid yours yet? They are problematic because they live, eat, and play at the top of the power heap. And change, as every good change maker knows, works from the bottom up, be it from the right or the left. So to invert a phrase of Michelle Obama's, when they go high, we ought to go low, as in local. All the most significant policy reversals of the last 40 years have started in the states. Think about reproductive choice, affirmative action, welfare repeal. Those rollbacks haven't happened by accident, and nor did civil rights. Since the late 1960s, the Republican Rights Alliance of corporate, military, prison industrial, and influence peddling forces have pushed ideas like choice hurts women and unions are bad for workers, and popularize them through a web of interrelated think tanks, media, and fake grassroots lobbying groups. They've collaborated to become the most powerful force in U.S. governance, and they've done it. While the money media weren't really looking, Republicans doubled their control in the states during the Obama administrations. The 2016 election saw the Republicans pick up four more trifectas, Iowa, Kentucky, Missouri, and New Hampshire, for a total of 25 states where they control all branches of government. Democrats control just six. Contrary to the media meme of madcap meltdown and chaos, it's business as usual in the states today. Donald Trump's a loose cannon, but the Milwaukee-based Lyndon Harry Bradley Foundation, for example, is utterly methodical. Bradley's been pouring mountains of money into right-wing causes, especially anything that will defund big labor. And while Trump may not have been their candidate, he is ideal cover, and it's a virtuous or is that vicious cycle. Anti-labor laws and declining labor membership doesn't just boost corporate profits by suppressing wages. They also result in depleted labor coffers and depressed democratic turnout. You can read more about the right's weaponized philanthropy in a trove of documents turned up by PR Watch and the Center for Media and Democracy. But don't get lost in the details. The point is, power shifts happen bottom up. While Marx may not have meant this exactly, he warned of the distracting power of bread and circuses. The Trump mayhem is one hell of a circus, but right-wing bread's still going to the roots. 
Thanks for listening. You can write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com and tell me what you think.